Okay, we'll get started. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This is the uh, fifth of five events this weekend talking about ending the war in Afghanistan. Um, and you all do Greater Redmond credit with the turnout. I'm delighted to see so many people here on um, what is an absolutely gorgeous day on a long weekend. So <laughs> clearly there is real interest in the issue, um, for which I thank you. Uh, I'm Darcy Berner, uh, among other things, running for Congress in Washington's newly drawn first congressional district, and a member of the Afghanistan Study Group, which is a group of um, actually bipartisan experts uh, who worked to put together a plan to end the war in Afghanistan. And with me today is retired Major General Paul Eaton, who was one of our commanding generals in Iraq. Um, he and I, back in 2008, had worked together on uh, a thing called the Responsible Plan to End the War in Iraq, which more than 60 candidates for the US House and Senate had endorsed. And uh, he actually excitedly uh, called me one afternoon and said, Barack Obama just quoted your plan on national television. So we've been doing this, let's try to end the wars thing together for quite a while. Um, what we're going to try to do today is walk through in basic terms um, kind of what's going on in Afghanistan, why we need to end the war, and what some of the difficulties are. One of the problems that I think that our political discourse suffers from frequently in this country is that um, folks on either side of the political spectrum ask you to take it on faith that the position that they are espousing is the correct one. And so we here uh, are going to instead kind of lay out costs, benefits, complications, difficulties so that you have a better understanding of what's going on in Afghanistan and can make a fully informed decision about what your position is. Um, we'll be, I'll be pretty clear about what my position is. Um, but I want you to have a, as much of an understanding as we can convey in a relatively short period of time. Um, to that end, if you have questions, ask. Um, we will happily uh, take an attempt to answer them. Most of the time, we do pretty well. Um, and uh, with that, let us begin. So the key question we have, and that we're going to try to answer, is given that we don't have teleporters or magic wands, both of which would be very handy if any of you invent one or the other, please let me know. But without those things, what's the right course for the US? That is, if we said we wanted to teleport all of our troops out today, we obviously couldn't do it. Um, if we said that we wanted to wave a magic wand and make Afghanistan peaceful, prosperous, happy, and a place where women have full equality in the society by waving a magic wand, we can't do that either. Reality-based. What can we... Pardon me. <laughs> no. Um, what can we and should we do in Afghanistan moving forward? That's the fundamental question we're trying to answer. Does that make sense? Yep. Everyone with me? Okay. So um, let's start with where we're at right now. We're spending about $100 billion per year in Afghanistan, which is about $250 million per year from this congressional district alone. Think for just a minute about what we could do with $250 million of investment a year here. Um, 1,982 US soldiers have been killed, more than 10,000 US soldiers wounded. Um, there are varying estimates of how many Afghan civilians are dead. Um, the most reliable ones I can find say that there are at least 20,000 Afghan civilians dead. I've seen no reliable estimates of how many uh, civilians have been wounded, but certainly uh, the likelihood is that it's substantially higher than 100,000. So the situation is fairly dire. Um, I have a picture on the screen. This is my friend Phil Svitak. Um, Phil was one of the first US soldiers killed in Afghanistan. Um, he and I went to high school together and served together in a Civil Air Patrol unit. Um, I understand why Phil died. He uh, was a door gunner on a helicopter um, in Afghanistan that was chasing an Al Qaeda unit uh, and was shot. I don't understand why the soldiers who are there right now continue to die. And so a lot of what we're going to be talking about is why are we still there, at least nominally, and what does it take to get us out? Did you have anything you wanted to say, sir? Just to put things in perspective from my point of view, uh, I grew up in the military. I served 33 years in the Army as an infantryman. And so I'm no shrinking violet when it comes to using the military appropriately as a tool of national power. All three of my kids are soldiers. My two sons have had, between them, five years in Afghanistan. So we're, what we're about here is the appropriate application of the military for U.S. foreign policy national security issues. And uh, what we've got going on here, what we had going on in Iraq, 
is, uh, is simply not judicious use of the military to uh, further U.S. aims. Um, so to kind of structure the conversation, we came up with 10 things we thought you might like to know about what's going on in Afghanistan. Um, we'll go through each of these one by one so you don't have to memorize the list from this one slide. Um, but these are the 10 basic facts on the ground that it's really helpful to understand as we're thinking about what we do next. Um, the first one, Al-Qaeda is essentially gone. So we went into Afghanistan because we were attacked by Al-Qaeda on September 11th. And our military was given the task of ensuring that Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan could not attack us again. Um, they have succeeded. Uh, the last CIA estimates that were published were that there were only between 50 and 100 members of Al-Qaeda uh, of any significance left in Afghanistan. Um, some of it is that we've killed a tremendous number of them. Some of it is that they've gone to other countries. So Al-Qaeda exists in places like Yemen still. Um, but they are largely not in Afghanistan at this point. If you think about 100 members of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and $100 billion a year in expenditures, it's a billion dollars per year per member of Al-Qaeda, um, which is a fairly disproportionately large expenditure, if that's the justification for our continued presence there. Our counter-terrorist approach in a lot of other failed or near-failed states is a very small footprint on the ground, if at all, generate intelligence, identify your targets, kill your targets. And it does not mean putting 100,000 young Americans into a country in order to execute nation building, whatever the intent is, plus another 50,000 NATO troops. So the logic to keep U.S. units and NATO units in Afghanistan for counter-terrorist approach just doesn't hold for uh, most of us who study the problem. Um, the second thing it's useful to understand is Afghanistan is a regional problem. The issues that we face in Afghanistan can't be solved by thinking about Afghanistan alone. Um, we have conveniently provided you with a map this afternoon. Um, you'll note that Afghanistan has some interesting borders. Um, there's a significant border with Iran. Um, but the most, oh, and by the way, this is China up here, so they actually touch China, um, which is relevant from an economic perspective. But the most significant border is here with Pakistan. Um, for those of you who don't deeply follow the politics of uh, much of the rest of the world in the Middle East, there's a lot of tension right now between Pakistan and India. Um, they are both nuclear states, um, so both have nuclear weapons. Um, they... Uh, there's a lot of tension. India is bigger, more powerful, has more wealth, has more people. So some of what we see going on in Afghanistan is Pakistan acting um, in ways that are designed to make Pakistan and Afghanistan act as a unit relative to India. Um, we cannot solve the issues that are going on in Afghanistan or even really fully understand them without understanding that dynamic. This is a regional problem, and whatever solutions we propose are going to require we get not just the folks inside of Afghanistan at the table, but um, we're going to have to have a regional discussion about what's going on. The military feels that it has been left alone to solve this problem. And what we would really like to see is the State Department to be better supported. Uh, Richard Holbrook, Ambassador Holbrook, uh, recently passed, replaced by Mark Grossman. We would really like to see a national effort behind him to conduct this regional program. Every border, every country border in Afghanistan has a, uh, has a dog in this fight. They want an outcome that's going to uh, meet a regional uh, uh, approval. So we've got to uh, pursue this better than we have in the past. And what we have not seen is a collective regional approach to get every country bordering Afghanistan into a room and work out what is it that you can contribute to a positive outcome here. It hasn't happened. We've got the NATO uh, summit that just occurred. We've got the Bonn uh, summit that happened in the past. But we don't have the regional approach with the bordering countries that have a vested interest in the outcome. It just hasn't happened. The American military has been shouldering the load on this thing. 
Um, Afghanistan has tremendous economic and cultural problems, not just military ones. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, in fact, the CIA World Factbook says it is about the 20th poorest country in the world, and that is after we've poured billions of dollars in aid in. G gross domestic product per person is about $585 a year. Um, imagine, if you will, for a minute, trying to feed your family on $585 per person per year. Um, it is a tremendously poor country. Has the worst infant mortality rate in the world, the worst maternal mortality rate in the world. 72% of the adult population in Afghanistan is illiterate, um, with uh, roughly 90% of the women in Afghanistan being illiterate. So there are these tremendous problems which um, shape what's possible in the short term and what's necessary in the long term in Afghanistan. And it's important to understand these as an underlying piece of what's going on. When my oldest was in Afghanistan, his first tour, his brigade commander, a colonel, showed up in the New York Times on the front page, interviewed, and his comment was, I have enough combat power to conduct my security mission. What I need for those uh, Afghan uh, villages in my area of operations, I need dentists, I need doctors, I need agricultural experts, I need water engineers. That's the other part of this counterinsurgency thing, that's the nation building. If you're gonna do it, if you're going to take this on as a mission, then take it on. And we've not done that particularly well. Um, tribes matter a great deal in Afghanistan. Um, in this country, um, our identity as Americans is pretty central uh, to our identity. In Afghanistan, by contrast, there isn't a strong sense of national identity. Um, there is instead a strong sense of tribal identity. Um, the light the tan area here, which you'll note extends well into Pakistan, um, is the traditional area of the Pashtun tribe, which is the largest uh, tribe in Afghanistan. It's about 41% of the total Afghan population. Um, the, what's going on in Afghanistan right now is a civil war between some elements of the Pashtun tribe, um, led largely by the Taliban, who are members of the Pashtun tribe against the existing central government in Afghanistan, and we're in the middle of this civil war. Um, that tribal identity and the centrality of tribal identity to the Afghan people plays a big role in what is and isn't possible in terms of um, where we go from here. Uh, I will tell you a, a little story. I was at a conference in Berlin uh, in November, just prior to the Bonn conference, actually in which we were talking about what would happen in Afghanistan after the, the um, NATO troops, including the US, pulled out. And I was sitting down at dinner, and um, I was sitting next to two young Pashtun tribe members um, who were in graduate studies at university in Berlin. And I was sitting across from the former British ambassador to Afghanistan. And the British ambassador was saying, um, you just have to understand, you need to support your central government, you need to recognize these national boundaries, you need to, and the, one of the two um, young people sitting next to me said, why on earth should some arbitrary line that you all drew affect our ability to see our families? That the perception of identity is very different and that has a role to play in what is and isn't possible as we move forward. As, a, as a, another example of the impact of tribe, the, uh, the beginning of the end of the Iraqi insurgency, uh, partway through 2006, started when Colonel Sean McFarland, who was commanding a cavalry regiment, engaged with the Sunni sheikhs in his area of operations, who had had a belly full of the, uh, the Al-Qaeda who had really overstepped their, uh, uh, their bounds. He, engaging with his sheikh, really got rolling this uh, Sunni awakening, this, uh, this sons of Iraq that uh, helped get things turned around in, in Iraq. That kind of tribal engagement is 
capital to achieving an outcome here in Afghanistan that's going to be satisfactory? Um, the Taliban are locals. Uh, when we went after al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda were people who were not Afghans. They were largely people who had come there from other countries. Um, and it was possible then for our military to say, we're going to kill them all, and largely do so. Um, you cannot kill your way out of, con uh, out of a conflict in Afghanistan with the Taliban because they're Afghans. Um, if you look at that 41% of the population who are Pashtun, a significant percentage of that 41% um, are sympathetic to the Taliban who are Pashtun tribal members. Whatever it is that we are going to proceed with with, with respect to the Taliban, the idea that we can kill our way out of this problem um, isn't going to work. Now, I want to be clear that that does not mean that I think that the Taliban are anything other than horrible people. Um, the, their human rights record with respect to women, with respect to ethnic minorities and religious minorities is horrific. Um, I, uh, when I was at that conference I mentioned earlier in Berlin, um, one of the sessions I was participated in, there were about 25 of us in a room in the German Bundestag, which is their um, parliament building, uh, at a round table. Three of the people in that, in that roughly 25 were senior members of the Taliban. And they kept saying, we just want to reunite Afghanistan and bring it peace. We just want to reunite Afghanistan and bring it peace. And one of the other guys who was there said, well, you have this terrible record when it comes to the rights of ethnic and religious minorities. And they said, oh, we understand. We made mistakes last time we were in power. We will respect the rights of ethnic and religious minorities in Afghanistan. And I'm sitting there thinking, there's something missing from that statement. So I raised my hand. The room was about a third women. I was the only woman who was allowed to speak. And I asked my question, which is, will you respect the fundamental equality, politically, economically, and socially, of the women who are 60% of the Afghan population? To which the answer was, hell no, how dare you ask? Um, they went off the handle and ended up ending the meeting, because I had dared to ask the question. And um, apparently, two weeks later, they were at the White House and demanded no woman be allowed in the room. You'll be glad to know that the White House did not accede to that demand. Um, but uh, I do not want any of the discussion in what's, what's reality on the ground and what's necessary to be misinterpreted as me thinking um, anything positive about the Taliban. Um, I just. Say You've got to engage these guys. The military is in the middle of a civil war there, and if you don't talk to the Taliban, then uh, things are just not going to uh, move forward, and you're still in a full conflict phase. There are those uh, running for office right now who say it's wrong to, uh, to talk to the Taliban. Uh, that represents a very immature and short-sighted approach to uh, prosecuting foreign policy, and uh, that is the uh, the platform upon which uh, Governor Romney is running, and uh, uh, the military just uh, thinks that's uh, immature as an approach and uh, unwise. Um, because this is a civil war that's going on in Afghanistan, the only way to end any civil war is through political reconciliation. You get people to agree to some um, allocation of power, some set of rules that everyone's willing to abide by, um, and then you move forward. That is the only way to end any civil war. What's needed in Afghanistan is a political reconciliation. One of the problems we have, though, is that the presence of foreign troops and foreign money makes it incredibly difficult to get to that political reconciliation. Here's why. Gross domestic product of Afghanistan is about $14 billion a year. The US troop presence in Afghanistan is about $100 billion a year. If you're someone in Afghanistan who's thinking about what kind of power you want to negotiate for, are you going to negotiate for a slice of that $14 billion or for a chunk of that $100 billion in power? Which one would you go for? The discussion about how power is going to be allocated in Afghanistan after we leave can't happen while we are such an overwhelming force in the country. So the political reconciliation, which is the only way to end the civil war, won't happen so long as we're there indefinitely. As far as reintegration, reconciliation, I uh, got back from Uganda uh, about a week and a half ago, 
after working with the African Land Forces Summit and uh, sponsored by United States uh, AFRICOM. The number of countries who, whose chiefs of defense were there who have gone through some kind of insurgency, some kind of civil war, and it kind of, it starts for a lot of reasons. I mean, insurgencies uh, start for any number of reasons, but so often right now in many countries and in Africa, youth unemployment, youth unemployment sponsors gangs, youth unemployment plus gangs and political ideology gets you an insurgency. And uh, the way these men were talking about how they reached out to their fellow citizens, many of them very young, on how to identify them, disarm them, reintegrate them into uh, society, and sometimes integrate them into the armed forces. So that is a process that uh, is in play throughout the planet. It's going to be in play here. Um, corruption is a huge issue in Afghanistan. Um, the, the basic mode of operation of the Afghan government is that um, as money passes through, the uh, people, the officials in power take slices of it. Um, so they're personally pocketing a fairly significant percentage of all of the money that goes through the Afghan economy right now. That's problematic because it makes it almost impossible for your average Afghan citizen to trust government or government officials. Um, and dealing with that corruption problem is a big piece of the problem in Afghanistan. I'm going to ask a question, and I don't want anybody to, uh, to answer this question, but uh, how many people here have successfully bribed an American policeman? <laughs> I wouldn't try because the, uh, the chances of, uh, of getting thrown in jail are awfully good. So I'm really careful how I pull out my driver's license so that no bills come along with it. So that's not the case in many parts of the planet. And it's certainly not the case with Afghan policemen. And the, you know, the Afghan citizen, as, as he approaches the Afghan policeman, is concerned, is this guy going to be more dangerous to me and my welfare than Taliban? So is the government going to be more dangerous to me than the Taliban? And the police are the face of the government. The corruption's worse because it goes vertically. It goes that younger policeman is subject to the uh, depredations of his chain of command. So if he wants time off, it's, it's going to cost. If he wants vacation, it's going to cost. If he wants ammunition in certain cases, it's going to cost. So it's a real problem and it's something that uh, is certainly in the way of, of, of success here. Counterinsurgency versus counterterrorism. Um, so there are two possible things the U.S. might be trying to achieve in Afghanistan. Um, and roughly in, in normal English as opposed to military speak. Um, counterterrorism, we go find the bad guys, we kill them. Um, we're very good at this. Uh, that's what the drone strikes are. We find the bad guys, we kill them. Unfortunately, it, ha it tends to have this side effect of killing lots of civilians. Um, anybody who happens to be in the vicinity, children, women, doesn't matter. Um, Counterinsurgency, on the other hand, is a completely different objective. It's where you have a violent, uh, a state of violence, and you're trying to quell the violence and bring about peace and stability. In order to accomplish counterinsurgency, you need folks to buy into some central governmental authority and its legitimacy. You need them to support such a thing. And every time you kill a civilian, you undermine the counterinsurgency operation. One of the problems that we've had in US policy over the last couple of years is that we've been saying we've been doing counterinsurgency, but we've largely been doing counterterrorism. And those two things do not fit together. Um, we, I have been somewhat uncharitably perhaps describing it as the split the baby problem. Um, it's tremendously expensive to do actual counterinsurgency. Um, but counterterrorism seems unsatisfying, and so uh, they went halfway in between, which is the worst of all possible worlds. 
Our doctrine, Army doctrine and uh, Ground Force Marines uh, uh, collaborate with what we do, it comes out of Fort Leavenworth in the middle of Kansas. And uh, our counterinsurgency doctrine specifies that one U.S. soldier or U.S. soldier equivalent to 40 citizens in the country where you are going to wage counterinsurgency is the math. That gives you very large numbers when you're dealing with 20 and 30 million people in a country. So it's expensive from a perspective of, of force structure. Then you overlay the money that's going to take uh, to get into the nation building. Then you have to ask, is the cost worth the benefits that we're going to accrue from nation building in a land far, far away? When we went into Iraq, one of the assumptions was that we would be in and out quickly, that the government, that the infrastructure, the political infrastructure would remain intact, that we would be greeted by rose petals in the streets, and it didn't work out that way, and we did not have a backup plan to support that. Military planners, and this is the, an indictment on the Bush administration, military planners always have assumptions. For each assumption, that may fail, and any assumption can, then you have to have a branch plan to address the failed assumption. Military Planning 101. We did not do any of that at the directive of the Secretary of Defense. So obviously the assumptions failed. We did not have the force structure or the mechanisms in play to, uh, to stop the, the boil that happened in Iraq. At that point, Iraq became a fundamental, if not a vital national interest, because it's astride the oil lines of communication. At that point, it became a truly important uh, country that could not fail. That's what drove the, uh, you know, Colin Powell's the potter, pottery uh, barn rule, you break it, you own it. Well, we broke it and then we had to take it and, and usher it into some kind of success. Afghanistan is not one of those countries. It is not a vital national interest. Um, in case I didn't mention it in my introduction, uh, General Eaton was the first general to publicly call for Donald Rumsfeld's resignation. Um, I believe you referred to him as incompetent, sir? <laughs> I did, incompetent tactically, operationally, and strategically. So uh, the guy pretty much, uh, pretty much covered it. In, in the New York Times, no less. Um, next statement is usually the most controversial one in the room. Women in Afghanistan matter. Um, who here agrees that women in Afghanistan matter? <laughs> who here disagrees and thinks that the fate of women in Afghanistan isn't our concern? Oh, we usually have a few. Um, women in Afghanistan um, do matter. The right has used women and the fate of women in Afghanistan as a wedge um, around this war, and we have to stop letting them do so. The fate of women in Afghanistan does matter, but the primary problems that women in Afghanistan have are cultural and economic, not military. The, um, this is a picture, women in Afghanistan. Um, this is um, a nonprofit that works to give women chickens and teaches them how to be poultry farmers, to uh, raise more chickens, to use the eggs, to sell the eggs, um, as a means of getting economic self-sufficiency. Um, I donate every month to an organization, a, a similar nonprofit called Women for Women International, um, which takes women through um, a year-long program to teach them uh, how to be self-sufficient and survive in the society that they're in. Founded by an Iraqi woman. That's right. Uh, and I, I, just, I just finished my sponsorship of a woman in Iraq and got assigned to a woman in Afghanistan, so I'm feeling like I'm covering all of my bases right now. Um, the, those kinds of programs, the kinds of programs that help women in Afghanistan economically, are a huge piece of the solution, and we should absolutely be investing in them. They're um, available spottily throughout the country, the more broadly we can make such programs available to women, um, the better off they will be. Um, it matters strategically to us as a country, um, apart from just the altruism. Um, there is a selfish reason for us wanting women in Afghanistan to do well. And that selfish reason is the country will not be stable 
as long as women there do not do well. And an unstable Afghanistan presents um, a, a security risk to the rest of the world, particularly bordering on Pakistan. If Afghanistan were to fail, there's some non-zero chance Pakistan would fail. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Um, so this is a not small problem. The solution is to empower women. Um, in addition to the kinds of economic things that can make a difference, uh, there are some interesting cultural things um, that have been starting to make a difference with respect to women in Afghanistan. So there was a study that was done late last year um, which figured out that more than 90% of the Afghan population now watches television on a regular basis. Uh, this is a big change. And the numbers one, two, and four television stations in Afghanistan are all run by a company called Tolo TV. Um, Tolo TV is a partnership between a wealthy Afghan family and um, a, an Australian television station. All of the shows are uh, produced in Afghanistan with Afghan crews and Afghan actors, um, mostly fairly young. Uh, and um, they're designed to be uh, obviously culturally appropriate. Um, but also to help push the envelope a little on some of the cultural issues that Afghanistan has. So we talked a little bit earlier about the fact that Afghanistan doesn't have a, a strong national identity as a country. One of their most popular shows is this travelogue, where they have this kind of goofy guy who goes to different places in the country, and he'll go to a village, and he'll talk about the scenery and you know what that village does economically, and he'll have dinner with one of the families, and um, it's tremendously popular. And what it does is it allows people who otherwise might never leave their village to see what the rest of this country they are a part of is like and make it feel like there, it, there's an us there, which is a constructive thing. Um, another one of their very popular shows is a soap opera. Uh, and one of the main storylines uh, this last year on that soap opera involved a young woman uh, who had been betrothed before she was even born to this guy who turned out to be uh, an opium addict and uh, an abuser. Uh, she didn't want to get married to him, and there was, they sort of covered the struggle of her not wanting to get married to him, and then he beat her, and she was hospitalized. And, and the overwhelming response in Afghanistan among the population was sympathy for the woman, which is a shift culturally in what the stories are that they have in their heads. Um, these changing the stories that people have in their heads about women, about the situations they face, about what the right thing to do is, is the single biggest thing that needs to happen for women in Afghanistan if we want them to be successful. So things like Tolo TV are tremendous tools to start to make that happen. And we know that they're being at least somewhat successful. Here's how we know. Because the elections for the Afghan parliament just happened. And there's a set aside in the Afghan constitution that says 25% of the seats are reserved for women. More women won than the set aside required. Which means, by the way, that the Afghan parliament has a higher percentage of women, women than the US Congress. Um, um, women in Afghanistan do matter. Don't let anyone on the right tell you that the only thing we can do for them involves guns. There are a lot of really good things we can do for Afghan women that do not involve an infinite amount of blood and treasure um, that this country can't afford. Finally, Pakistan is deeply entwined. Um, I talked a little bit about this, but it's important not to underestimate the degree to which Pakistan is um, part of what we're seeing. The insurgency in Afghanistan is largely um, the Taliban fighting against the central government, roughly speaking. I mean, it's somewhat more complicated than that, but roughly speaking. Um, the Taliban are being sheltered and, as far as we can tell, funded by the Pakistani government. Um, the Pakistani government's interest is in undermining the central government of Afghanistan, because if Afghanistan's central government isn't strong, then Afghanistan might be essentially a protectorate of Pakistan, which is useful to them as they're thinking about their position relative to India. Pakistan is a huge piece of this. Right now, we're in the middle of a tiff with Pakistan where we're kind of not really talking to them. Um, and that's problematic. We can't solve these problems without talking to Pakistan. The military, when they embark upon an operation and they're going after an environment to influence it, like to isolate that environment. It's specifically called isolating the objective so that you don't have any more variables 
come into play as you deliver a military effect. And it doesn't have to be a lethal effect, it's just a military effect. Well, that long border that uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan share is very porous. We talked about tribes. There's a lot of things going back and forth. The Haqqani network, the Taliban basing in uh, Pakistan reminds the military a lot of what happened in Vietnam where we had Vietnam uh, next to Laos and Cambodia providing safe haven to, uh, to the, to the uh, uh, Viet Cong and to the North Vietnamese. So all of that contributed to a very difficult time for uh, our prosecution of the Vietnam War, another war that we did not need to fight, and represents a problem here where the Pakistanis are providing safe haven to a lot of those who come into Afghanistan to cause us problems. So how do we end the war? Um, I have a piece of very significant good news, which is that between the time we scheduled these events and the time we are executing them today, um, NATO met to discuss Afghanistan, and we changed course on the war. We changed course in a direction that is overwhelmingly positive. The president announced that we will be removing combat troops by mid-2013 and will be essentially entirely out by the end of 2014. I wish it were faster. Um, I wish we had teleporters. That would simplify <laughs> things a lot. Um, but it represents a tremendous amount of progress in terms of the direction of the country with respect to this war, that we're no longer committing to an indefinite presence militarily in Afghanistan. That's progress. That being said, we need to apply pressure to the president. Um, so in 2009, I was at this event called Netroots Nation. That's a big conference of bloggers. And one of the keynote speakers was um, former President Bill Clinton. And President Clinton was up in front of this room um, speaking. Uh, he was talking about health care reform, because the big health care reform bill was on the table. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard him talk live. He's very, very good live. Um, so he was up there delivering this well-prepared speech, and he sounded great. And in the middle of the speech, one of the people in the audience stood up and started yelling at him about don't ask, don't tell. And he went completely off script. He stepped aside, and I got the most genuine moment I have ever seen from a current or former president of the United States. And he said, it is your fault that we have don't ask, don't tell as policy. I didn't want to sign it, but I was under a tremendous amount of pressure from the right, and the left was completely missing. You weren't there. You gave me no room to maneuver. You gave me no space. You applied no pressure, and there was nothing else I could do. It is your fault, don't ask, don't tell is law. Whether or not we agree with that interpretation, the lesson there is an important one, which is we have to apply pressure even on our allies. Um, I say that as somebody who is asking to represent probably almost everyone in this room in the US Congress, which means I'm asking you to hold me accountable too, to apply pressure to me, to make sure I do the right thing, to make sure the other members of Congress do the right thing, to make sure our senators do the right thing, to make sure the president does the right thing. It is necessary if we want our democracy to work as it is supposed to. And it will be uncomfortable for the elected officials, and they will squirm, and they will complain, and that's what you are supposed to do. Um, so pressure the president, because although he's on a course that's promising, it's going to take pressure from us in a sustained way to make sure that there's no backsliding. Um, make this an election issue. You should be asking people who want your vote where they're at on ending the war in Afghanistan. I was asked at an earlier event um, whether there was something more specific than ending the war in Afghanistan you might want to ask about. One thing you could do, um, I worked as part of the Afghanistan study group. We produced a report available at afghanistanstudygroup.org um, called A New Way Forward, which laid out the reasons why we needed to end the war and, and some of the ways, some of the hows. Um, you can ask somebody whether they support and endorse what was listed in the Afghanistan study group report. That's useful for a couple of reasons. It gives you something more concrete than the very vague, do you want to end the war in Afghanistan? It also forces them to educate themselves a little, which is always a good thing when it comes to candidates and electeds. Um, that report, by the way, was interesting in that uh, the coalition that put it together was actually um, bipartisan. The experts were people from both sides of the aisle. 
Um, and then I brought a bunch of the Congressional Progressive Caucus members that I was working with, the roughly 80 most progressive members of the US House and Senate on board. We also got um, Congressman Walter Jones, who's a Republican. He was the one who decided that French fries had to be called Freedom Fries in the House cafeteria. Um, but Walter Jones endorsed it, um, and he got a bunch of the Tea Party freshman Republicans to endorse it. Grover Norquist has endorsed it, and Coulter has endorsed it. So this is not some, no one can portray this as some crazy, impractical thing. This is something that, you know, a sufficient number of very serious people have deigned as plausible. Um, and I think that it's worth pointing out that the right way to do bipartisanship is to make them come to our correct position. <laughs> um, the, uh, yes, so make it an election issue. Um, please talk and write about the need to end the war in Afghanistan. About three quarters of the American population believes that we should end the war, which means basically all of the Democrats, most of the independents, and half of the Republicans in the country think that it's time for us to end the war. Um, but it is not an issue that is being talked or written about in adequate amounts to get anyone's attention. And that's a problem. Um, I'm talking and writing about it, but I need your help because I'm not sufficient all by myself. I have um, some soapbox, but not a gigantic soapbox. One uh, small secret of politics, which I will let you in on in the talking and writing about it uh, section, um, but please don't tell any elected officials I told you. Virtually every elected official and every candidate has a Google alert set on their own name. And so if you want to get the attention of some elected official, one of the easiest things that you can do is you can write um, a blog post or a letter to the editor or something. Um, I personally like using Daily Coast because anyone can make an account there and anyone can write a diary there. If you use their name, they will get a Google alert linked to your article and they will read it because they want to know what's being said about them. So use their name, spell it correctly because they usually only have it set on the correct spelling of their name. Um, and that's one of the most effective ways to get messages through the bubble to the person you are trying to reach because they all have Google alerts set on their own name. Um, but don't tell them I told you. <laughs> Um, don't skip over the uncomfortable bits. Uh, I had this ongoing argument when we were putting together the report for the Afghanistan study group in which I said, we have to talk about the Taliban and we have to talk about women. And they said, no, 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 those are controversial. And I was like, people will assume the worst case scenario if you're not willing to talk about it. That's a problem for us. For so long, we've been unwilling to talk about the fact that the Taliban probably will be part of the ultimate coalition government as the political reconciliation plays out and what that means. We've been unwilling to talk about the fate of women in Afghanistan after we leave and what that means. That unwillingness to talk about the uncomfortable bits undermines us. And we are much better off taking them on and talking about them than we are avoiding them. We really are at an inflection point. We have an opportunity right now, a, a golden moment, in which to dramatically change the course of this country on this war. We all need to work together to make it happen. When um, I, I have a fairly long history of attempting to end the wars, I uh, did not set out to be a politician originally. Um, I was not one of those kids who was like, I will be a politician when I grew up. I, I started out as a computer programmer, um, which is much more straightforward in many ways. You type in the code, it does what you tell it to. Um, hopefully, usually. Um, but in 2003, there were two things that happened to me in fairly quick succession which changed my perspective on how I should be spending my time. Um, the first thing that happened was a very good thing, which is that my son Henry was born. Uh, we, I'd been married for 10 years at that point. We had essentially given up hope. So he was very much a uh, wanted and cherished child. And um, I, we did what I think all new parents do. We said, how do we give this child the kind of life we want him to have? Um, what school district should we live in? Do you have to feed small children all organic fruits and vegetables? Um, does every little boy need a golden retriever? Um, yes. In case you're wondering, the answer is yes. Every little boy needs a golden retriever. Um, but when Henry was about two months old, my brother Jason marched into Iraq with the initial invading force. 
And I had this realization as I was holding Henry in one arm and packing a care package for Jay with the other, that there was no set of choices that I could make as an individual parent that was going to be sufficient to give my son the kind of life I wanted him to have if we didn't change the direction of the country. Um, so I did what any sensible mother would do. I quit my job and left my career and ran for Congress. Um, <laughs> I um, ran in the old 8th district, as many of you know, uh, against Dave Reichert and got closer to, being, closer to winning than any Democrat in history in that district. It's never elected a Democrat. But I came close enough in both 2006 and 2008 that we didn't know for a week who had won. Um, in the 2008 campaign, General Eaton and I worked together on a document called the Responsible Plan to End the War in Iraq. We had more than 60 candidates for the US House and Senate endorse that plan. And more than 200,000 citizen endorsers. We had people taking it to members of Congress. We had people taking it to the presidential debates. And it made a difference. Um, I remember getting a call from General Eaton, and he was like, Barack Obama just quoted the responsible plan. I was like, yes. <laughs> um, it made a difference. We made a difference. We can make a difference in ending this war. We can make a difference in setting the course that our country goes forward on. Um, I would posit that probably everyone in this room wants the same kind of a world that I want, which is a peaceful, stable, secure, sustainable world in which the fundamental human rights of every person are protected. That's what I'm trying to get to. It's going to take all of us working together to make that happen. But every day we work at it, we can get a little closer. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for paying such close attention. And we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Go ahead. Uh, part of watching these debates over the, the time, over you know the decades, um, it's always struck me that the, the, too many Americans are really clueless about the cost. What would it cost? Uh, we can all kind of figure out, you know, how much it costs me an hour to have the libraries in Seattle or how much an hour for schools. But what it would cost me when we let everything go to hell and, uh, for example, <clears throat> somewhere uh, early at the midpoint of the Iraq war, Senator McCain and two other senators went to Baghdad and went shopping and bought a bok choy or something. And um, they had 100 combat troops with them. And they had, I, I still remember this, it's like five attack helicopters with three over two. How much would it cost you to hire that private army to go buy a bok choy? I mean, where, where do I find those, where can I find those? I, I got a feeling like those numbers are sitting out there, but I have no experience with the military, so I don't even know how to Google this. Like, how do I find out, how can I rent an attack helicopter to buy a <laughs> bok choy? <laughs> Yeah, They're we're really, we're really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> if you got to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With all the disruption that we've brought to Afghanistan in this war, what what is now assumed, or what's our goal? What do we think we can? leave that's better? I mean, what, what do we expect the outcome to be? I mean, we have so meddled in this ancient culture that nobody else has been able to meddle in successfully to their goals. What, what, what's the outcome that's, that's now left as a realistic goal? So um, on the plus side, they were in such terrible shape when we got there that it would have been harder for them to get worse. Um, but that's not really an answer. Um, the, there are ways in which um, the population of Afghanistan is noticeably better off now than they were before we came. There are more hospitals, more doctors. Um, for all that those maternal and infant mortality rates are horrific, they are substantially better than they were 10 years ago. Um, that gross domestic product of 500 and some dollars a year is substantially higher than the, GD the GDP per capita was 10 years ago. Um, we have built infrastructure, roads, buildings, schools. Um, a larger percentage of the children in the country are educated um, than, than was the case. 
But if what we want is for Afghanistan to be a functional, um, stable society, um, there are a couple of things that that's going to require. Um, it's going to require a functional economy. Um, now, it is possible. Afghanistan has things of value. Um, they have some of the most significant and interesting valuable mineral deposits in the world. Um, and so it's possible for them, even in the short term, to be able to sustain themselves economically should, should they decide to develop those resources. Um, there is increasing amount, uh, there are increasing amounts of agriculture. Um, now, a significant amount of that is poppies, which is probably not optimal, but we're not actually eradicating the poppy crops there. That's not our goal. Um, the US Army has up on Flickr some lovely photos of US soldiers walking through fields of poppies. Um, makes me think that uh, the Wizard of Oz. Um, the, um, the fate of women in Afghanistan is tremendously important to, their, um, to, to what happens there long term. All of the research that's ever been done shows a very, very strong correlation between the well-being of women and the health of the society as a whole. And so the more we can do to help women in Afghanistan um, be able to feed themselves and their families, be educated, um, have a real role in that society, um, the, the better off they will be. Um, we've talked about some of the tools that we can use to do that. Um, if I had uh, a magic wand um, and I got one small to medium-sized wish with my magic wand, the thing I would wish for would be for every woman in Afghanistan to have a working cell phone. That in Bangladesh, Grameen Phone did this program where they were doing micro-lending of cell phones to women. Um, so women would take out these micro-loans, they would get a cell phone, they would sell the minutes to other women in their villages. Um, like Afghanistan, it, it was, it's a fairly conservative Muslim country in which once a woman gets married, she goes off to live with her husband's family and she probably never has a chance to talk to her own family again. So cell phones allowed people to talk to their families, allowed these women to talk to their families and made them economic engines in their own households, which changes the dynamic from the household up in terms of the role of women in the society. Um, one of the things we have started to see in legislation when Congress passes legislation relative to our policy regarding other countries where we think there are troubling human rights issues going on is increasingly um, the, gov the, the various government agencies will be directed to do whatever they can to help increase um, free access to the inter I mean access to the internet, access to the free internet, access to, you know what I mean, un 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 uninhibited access to the internet and um, to increase the prevalence of cell phones. That communications technology allows um, people to talk to each other, to organize, to change the stories in their heads, to work together in ways that without the technology they can't. Um, I cannot imagine uh, what it would be like to try to put something like this on without the ability to phone people, send emails. Um, even the postcards that we sent out involved trading files over the internet. Um, and so the uh, technology actually makes a big difference. And so that, that would be my one wish. Every woman in Afghanistan gets a cell phone. Bing! Um, but it's a long-term process. Um, and we should not expect that it will happen instantaneously. We should not expect that it will happen without some significant setbacks. Um, I have actually um, advocated with some of the women I know who are members of Congress that as we are leaving, we offer safe passage and political asylum to any woman in Afghanistan who's been part of the government because there is reason to believe that the Taliban will try to kill them. Um, and I think we owe it to them to offer them an opportunity to leave. Um, there will be setbacks. Um, this is a long-term process. Of the things you're saying, the, the status of women and a unified government for the country seem like they never happened in Afghanistan. Are those going to be regarded simply as part of our Western silent invasion that undermines their ancient culture and history and goes against what has never been before? Um, the status of women in Afghanistan actually hasn't always been as backwards as it is right now. Um, Pre-Taliban, pre-war with Russia, um, Afghanistan was, was thriving. I've seen pictures of 
discos in Kabul, um, uh, which are a little bit shocking now to look at, because we have this picture in our heads here that they've always been this incredibly backwards country. And that isn't actually true. Um, it is. Uh, that was during the days of the marijuana road. <laughs> it, you know, literally, I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was part of the culture in the uh, late 60s, early 70s and uh, get thee to Afghanistan because it was, it, it was kind of Amsterdam uh, back then. And, and, um, and up until the point that the Taliban took control, there were women practicing as doctors. There were schools women could attend. There were, and so um, it is not that those things have never existed in Afghanistan or even that they haven't existed in the lifetimes of the people there now. They have. Um, there are memories, and what's happened in the last 10 years with women being, you know, freer to go out, free to practice medicine, free to, um, has changed again the stories in people's heads in Afghanistan. Um, it's not a magic wand. I can't promise that, you know, we wave our magic wand and everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. But we can make progress, and we should set down a path that maximizes the chances that we'll do so. I have a slightly shorter answer. Yeah. Uh, we originally went into Afghanistan to uh, kill Al-Qaeda, the people who attacked us, and to deny safe haven for other terrorist organizations in Al-Qaeda. Uh, that remains a U.S. national interest in Afghanistan. Anything beyond that is, uh, is a benefit, but it is, does not represent a vital national interest. Well, they have. I mean, one of the problems is there isn't reliable power in most of Afghanistan. And when I say that most Afghans watch television on a regular basis, they don't necessarily do it in their own homes. Um, and uh, to, to make it possible for folks to have ac reliable access to the internet um, is a, is a non-trivial problem. Um, but what we show on television, what they show on television, makes a difference. Um, you know, and, and uh, as increasing access to the internet happens, um, one of the interesting things that a lot of U.S. universities are doing, uh, most recently a deal that was signed between MIT and Harvard, is they're actually putting their coursework online for free, available to anyone around the world who wants to access it. Um, and you, you don't end up with a Harvard degree or an MIT degree, but you can learn whatever you want, which I think at least opens up the possibility that as more connectivity happens, um, more folks will have an opportunity for world-class education. I heard doctors in Mexico say that you buy the medical text with their doctors, it's exorbitant for, for people. However, if they join the military hospital programs in the country, they can go on the internet and print out all the, the major textbooks that they use in medical school, and that way they can go for the cost of $105. They have medical school. The medical school itself is free, but they have to buy their books. So what I'm saying is more and more of this seems to be a very good way of getting education, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously somebody who likes technology. I, I was a software developer. Um, Pre-Microsoft, I did Unix, C, and C++ compiler and interpreter programming for any of you who are fellow geeks, um, which makes me pretty geeky. Which makes me very geeky. Um, but, uh, but it's also the case, realistically speaking, that they don't have the access to the networks to make that possible yet. Um, and it's one of the reasons. Um, I, I am very much one of the people who thinks that greater connectivity, greater ability for people to talk to each other and to the rest of the world um, holds the potential to make the world a much better place for most of its inhabitants. Go ahead. Can I ask you a question about yeah. the uh, war? Yes. Uh, none of the wars since World War II have really been self-defense of the U.S. has been engaged in. And the biggest ones, of course, were Korea, Vietnam, and the Middle East wars. And the millions of innocent people died in these wars. And those people never attacked America. And so what I'd like to know is, what are you doing to uh, address the underlying mechanisms that where the U.S. seems to keep getting into these wars every generation or so? And rather than just being an efficient uh, administration of tearing down this war, we're going to work real hard and take this one apart, and then we'll have more resources and have one in Iran. 
the one in Nigeria. And so what I'd like to know is, what are you doing about the basis lobby in the state of Washington, the people who want jobs, and the people with all these hundreds of thousands of paychecks here, and the Boeing lobby? Those are the two of the three, three or four large lobbies, the other one being Israel lobby. The, um, do we have chalk? It is an interesting question. The, um, there, are, there are kind of two big pieces to the problem that you describe. One is the military industrial complex is alive and well. Um, it's unusual, in fact, for uh, a retired general um, like Major General Eaton uh, to not be in some sort of uh, lobbying defense contractor job. Uh, he could make a lot more money that way. Um, fortunately, he has a conscience. Um, but, uh, but the military industrial complex is, thank you, uh, is an enormous issue. The other piece of the issue um, is we have to change the story in the heads of the American people. The Republicans have done this great job of saying that uh, over and over again, that the only options are um, violence or loss. That's the frame they use over and over and over again. And we need to call them out on that frame. That when they say those are the only two options, we need to say that's a false choice. Um, we have uh, one, one of the other talks that I've been giving to folks um, is about the different kinds of power that we can apply to change things, um, of which there are six. Um, political power. Um, who makes the rules? You all have the ability to exercise political power. We're here in this room today in part because I would like you to exercise some political power. Um, who we elect matters. Um, and the people that we elect both make the decisions and set the tone for a lot of the rest of what happens. Um, economic power. Um, who owns what? Um, we can exercise economic power in ways that are obvious and in ways that are less obvious. Um, it's obvious that if we want, you know, when, when we wanted South Africa um, to end apartheid, we engaged in divestment strategies. We pulled money out, um, and that resulted in an end to apartheid. That's an exercise of economic power. Um, the Montgomery bus boycotts were in part an exercise of economic power. Um, but we can also use economic power by choosing to buy things. We've changed the way that agriculture is done in the United States by choosing to buy organic food. Um, so anything that involves a transfer of money. In this particular case, if, for example, um, you do not like uh, a lot of the military industrial complex or the war on women or any of a number of other things, and you think the fact that the Koch brothers fund such activities is a problem, then ceasing to buy Dixie cups and brawny paper towels would probably be a good place to start since those are both Koch brothers products. Buy some other cup, some other brand of cups, and some other brand of paper towels. But don't buy Dixie cups. Don't buy brawny paper towels. Exercise economic power. We've talked a fair amount about military and police power. On whom can you enforce your rules? The Republicans seem to think that these are the only three forms of power that have any legitimacy. The force-based types of power, but the other three are actually more powerful. Cultural power, what stories do we tell ourselves about who we are? Um, a quick example, I, um, thank you. Uh, I um, grew up in a Republican household. My dad is a Republican. My youngest brother is a Republican. Uh, my dad spent years in the Air Force. He lives in Nebraska. In 2008, when I was a Democratic candidate for Congress, he went to the Republican National Convention. Um, uh, he came to see me. He came to see me at Netroots Nation last year, which is the sort of left-leaning conference of bloggers. Right Online, which is the right-leaning conference of bloggers, happens at the same time. He was coming to see a panel that General Eaton and I were on uh, and got distracted by the fact that uh, Michelle Bachman was there um, and watched her talk instead of mine. Um, <laughs> uh, but, my, but my dad and I get along really well. Um, I have an uncle, Charlie, uh, who's gay. Everyone in my generation has known he's gay for ages. He's a confirmed bachelor. He has roommates. Come on, how hard is this to figure out? But uh, he was in the closet for a really long time with the rest of my family. 
And in 2006, when uh, I was running the first time, the, the issue of where I, how I felt about gay marriage came up because the state Supreme Court was um, on the verge of handing down a decision which might have, which uh, was a challenge under the state's Equal Protection Clause um, around gay marriage. And I said, I think when two consenting adults fall in love and want to live happily ever after, we should throw bird seed and wish them the best of luck. My dad was very upset with me. How could I say this? It's terrible, 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 terrible. So I was talking to him before Christmas, and he was like, yeah, we were talking to your Uncle Charlie and his new boyfriend. And I was like, OK, cultural change, a cultural change. How many of you, sometime in the last five years, have seen a television show or a movie that involved a gay character? Virtually everyone, not accidentally. There are people in Hollywood whose job it is to work with scriptwriters to make sure that the portrayals of gay characters on television in the movies are sympathetic. Cultural change. Um, moral power. Uh, this is what stories uh, we tell ourselves about who we are. This is what stories we tell ourselves about who we're supposed to be. Um, they're not always the same. <laughs> um, and uh, network power. How many people can we reach? How many people can we communicate with? How many people can we talk to? These are all about consent. Um, anyone who has ever had to deal with a six-year-old knows that you cannot, force doesn't scale. You cannot force anyone to do anything for any significant period of time. Um, you eventually have to get to consent or it doesn't work. Consent scales. It is substantially more powerful. So when we're talking about what happens in Afghanistan, this is not the only set, this is not the only tool we have to impact the outcome. Not only are all of these powerful tools, these are ultimately more powerful. Go ahead. I, where are the rest of us, but most of us don't know this. See, yeah. This is the time when well, the Pentagon. Yeah, I mean, the, there are plenty of bad actors, particularly when it comes to profiting from war in this country. Um, I have no fondness for Eric Prince. I think uh, General Eaton has even less fondness for Eric Prince than I do, um, who is the founder of Blackwater. Um, the, um, the interesting thing about moral power is that there are two ways to use it, and both of them work to our advantage if we are willing to use them. Um, one, uh, my favorite thing, and I will confess that I'm sometimes, uh, I enjoy confrontation a little more than maybe I ought to. Um, but I really enjoy talking to um, uh, conservative Christians. Give me a conservative Christian to talk to any day. Because I like to ask them about the parts of the Bible that talk about need, the need to feed the hungry and care for the poor. And they often say things to me like, well, but that applies to private charity, not public acts. And I say, in a democracy, your vote is just another act that you can take. And the Bible doesn't distinguish between the actions that you take with your hands and the actions that you take with your vote. You're morally culpable for both, which usually gives them a long pause. Um, but the other way to use moral power, um, and the one that uh, our side of the aisle is sort of more famous for, is this is the basis for protests. This is the basis for um, the civil rights movement. It's the basis for what happened at Tiananmen Square. It's the basis for the Arab Spring. It's the basis for Occupy Wall Street, where you use protest to undermine consent. Um, five basic elements. There's a recipe. And if I see any of you trying to organize a protest without following the recipe, I will be very put out, because the recipe is what it takes for it to work. Um, first, whoever it is you're trying to reach, has to view the people doing the protest as innocent of any wrongdoing. Um, it works particularly well when you have children or old women. Um, either of those work very, very well, because um, they're assumed to be innocent. But whatever happens, you need the people doing the protest to be innocent. Um, you need them to voluntarily put themselves in harm's way for the sake of the thing you want them, for the sake of the thing they want to see change. Um, the use of official force has to be brought down on them um, in a way that is broadcast to the rest of the world and shocks the conscience. 
So if you think about civil rights movement, children being attacked by fire hoses and dogs, children fundamentally innocent, voluntarily putting themselves in harm's way, the use of official force broadcast to the rest of the world in a way that shocks the conscience, changes people's perception. If you think about the Occupy Wall Street protests, what were the moments in which Occupy Wall Street got traction? Young women trapped in barriers in New York City who had gone there to protest Wall Street being pepper sprayed by police officers in a way that was broadcast by uploading it to YouTube and shocked the conscience. UC Davis, same thing. Arab Spring, same thing. Tiananmen Square, same thing. Gandhi's protests in India, same thing. Here's your recipe. Please do not ever organize a protest without these five elements again. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's an issue that I think it was brought up, but you may, you may be aware of, which is a, it's actually a silent war that the Russians are, are engaged in with Afghanistan. And, it, and, it's, and it's around drugs, where somewhere between, I think, 30,000 youth in Russia are dying because of heroin addiction and drug abuse. And this is something that the drug minister of Russia, his name I'm forgetting, even up, has, has brought up to, to the U.S. and said, let's have a regional discussion so we can address this drug issue. It's big. Um, the role I think that we in the United States would play in that is something that he suggested in the presentation he did in Washington, D.C. around the Glass-Steagall uh, law, which bans speculative uh, banking from being protected by the, by the U.S. government, by FDIC. He said that drug money in, in the financial system is huge, and the benefits of it are huge, so it's going to continue to go on, and it's going to continue to kill our youth. So Glass-Steagall is good, and he was here promoting it. So there's a, that is very significant for Afghanistan, not just for the women, but for the men, for the whole country, and for its neighbors. And it's a very big issue. Um, so, so there's a bill in Congress, I don't know if you're aware of it, someone whose name rhymes with yours, Marcy Chapter. She, uh, she introduced it, H.R. 1489. It's got about 63 co-sponsors, including Walter Jones, Representative Walter Jones. Um, and, and this is it, I think. I think you want to hit this thing from the top down. Yeah. Because why would it, who, because I think one thing that I struggle with when I'm talking to people is a certain naivete that we don't, there, is, there isn't a real enemy. I think because we've gotten these wars that aren't, you know, real wars in a sense of, yeah, we've lost sight of the fact that we have a real enemy and that enemy is against all human development and progress, not just women, but it kind of kind of shows itself up for it in that in that way because we need to target that. Yeah. But just real quick. Um, um what was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you mentioned Marcy Captain yeah, legislation. There's a, there's a bill in Congress for it. Um um, so so um, uh, Congresswoman Kaptur uh, is one of the members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the 80 members that I was working with um, in Washington, D.C. Um, she is uh, fantastic on almost all issues. Um, there's one significant issue on which I disagree with her. But, uh, but the vast majority of the issues, she's pretty amazing on. Um, and if the bill is the one I think it is, it's to restore Glass-Steagall, which are the laws that would, that would uh, regulate the banking industry and, and prevent them from taking uh, undue risk uh, to the entire financial system. Um, I certainly support uh, reinstating Glass-Steagall. I think it was unacceptable that it was removed to begin with, that these basic protections that had been in place around the economy since uh, the Great Depression um, were rolled back. And uh, as much as I would like to blame the Republicans solely, those were protections that were rolled back under the auspices of President Clinton. Uh, so it is not, unfortunately, an entirely partisan issue. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, I'm sorry. I just remembered what I was saying. <laughs> um, the naivete that we don't have a real enemy. Um, the fact that, that this drug trade is going on 
um, that's the bigger issue. So the Black Steagle is pivotal. Yeah. If we get that, then that enemy is cut off from their, their money supply and their resources, which is the drugs, and then we bring in the whole nation's own policy for Afghanistan. So I don't know, if you, have you signed on to the HR 1489? Uh, well, as somebody who's not elected yet, I can't. I can certainly uh, say that I support it. Uh, no, no, it's OK. Um, I mean, I, I agree with you that we need to reinstate Glass-Steagall. Um, and, and Congresswoman Kaptur is uh, one, of, one of the members I would be delighted to work with on that. How Barney Frank on that? Because he was one of the people that took it away. Bar but Barney, Barney, well, Barney, unfortunately, is retiring. I, I think, unfortunately. I actually really like him. His willingness to. Um, is he nightly? No, I mean, he, he did not champion its repeal, and he's actually tried, the, the Frank Dodd legislation was an attempt to put some more constraints on the banking system. Um, but Senator Dodd said it well, I think, when he said that the problem is the banks owned this place, referring to DC. Um, we have a tremendous problem with money in the political system, as uh, many of you are probably well aware. Uh, and. Um, the actions that you take, the only reason money in the political system matters is because it affects how people vote. Um, the actions that you take with respect to who you elect, how you vote, what you're willing to talk to people about, have a big impact on whether that money has a significant impact in elections. Um, I will tell you a secret that probably no political consultant will ever tell you because it cuts into their potential profit margin. But the most impactful way, Mario, um, the most impactful way um, to convince somebody to vote in a particular way isn't a television commercial, isn't a piece of mail that we send. It's them talking to somebody they know about an issue or candidate and having you say something uh, positive or negative. Um, that has a substantially greater impression than anything we can actually spend money on. Um, I know that it's considered impolite in this society to talk about politics or money or religion. Um, but we have to get over that at least as far as politics is concerned. Um, because it is the only way for us to effectively take our country back. Um, I would like to have a democracy that actually works for the people of this country. And I am asking for your help in making sure that that happens. Go ahead. Just to summarize for me, and I'm not a real political person, rather than violence or loss, what would you say is a better <coughs> prescription up there? I mean, perhaps you just say all of these things. But by violence, I'm, I'm assuming we mean if the military, I want to get back to Afghanistan, if the military withdraws, what are our options? I think what's painted for us is that everything will go back where it was, Taliban will take over. They you're, think you're saying there's still ways we can have influence that's Yeah, they, they think that this is the only kind of influence that matters, right? That isn't true. I would much rather figure we will have more impact on what happens in Afghanistan in the long term by impacting what they see on television than, they, than we will by stationing soldiers there. But I think the picture that's been painted is once U.S. military withdraws, we lose our influence, they won't be able to watch television anymore. would be sort of a conclusion, right? Everything Taliban won't allow it and so on. Well, See what I mean? the, 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 the Taliban are not super popular with the Afghan population right now. It turns out that when you engage in an insurgency in which you kill your own people, that makes you not incredibly popular among those people. Um, it would be... Um, it, 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 it is almost certainly the case that the Taliban will have some role in the future of Afghanistan. It is not at all a given that the Taliban will control Afghanistan ever again. And those are two very, very different things. Um, it is almost certain in this country that the religious right will have a role in what happens here. That is not the same thing as saying that the religious right will control everything that happens here. Go ahead. Um, two questions. First of all, are you going to post this presentation on your website so that people who are here tonight will be able to see it? And then a more difficult question. Uh, I read on the internet, and I would like your answer about whether or not you believe this is true, that we reached an agreement that even though we're supposed to have maybe troops out in 2014, 
that we reached an agreement that we would still have troops there as late as 2024 and still have bases there. And I'd like to know whether you think that's true. And if you do not think that's true, what is the number of mercenaries that we have? And I do you know the number of mercenaries that we have in Iraq and Afghanistan and how much we're paying them. And tell me about the mercenary problem. So. Um, in answer to the first question, um, yes, we actually streamed one of the presentations live earlier today, and we'll have that up on the website. Um, and we're happy to make the slides available. And by the way, for those of you who don't know him, um, this is David Spring, who's running for the state legislature in the 5th Legislative District. Uh, so he, he, for some of you at least, is a candidate you can actually vote for. Um, and then, General, if you'd like to address it the It is true. Uh, the agreement, uh, the SPA, the Strategic... Uh, Whatever that stands for. Uh, I, I can't remember what the uh, acronym is. Uh, agreed that we would have a residual presence until 2024, that that presence was vague enough, the, de the definition was vague enough, that it will be an ask on the part of Afghanistan and a give on the part of the United States. And the two main lines on that is a counter-terrorist uh, platform, intelligence, and some kind of lethal uh, systems, and a train, advise, and assist for Afghan security forces development. There is an economic uh, component to that as well, but it was a vague outline, a vague agreement uh, between uh, Karzai and uh, President Obama. So, true, and vague so that we can develop that. That is something that we did not do with Iraq. It is something that we did do for over 50 years in Germany and Japan. America has a hard time leaving after we have committed forces. And it is frequently to the benefit of the country who invites us to stay. How about the mercenary? Tell me about I got to get some numbers the, on the mercenaries in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I don't have numbers on on mercenaries. I can give you categories, which are which is important. You have the logistics, and and when we say mercenaries, uh, we're talking contract personnel. You That's have lo you have you not necessarily. You have logistics, and uh, Kellogg, Brown, and Root is the, the poster child for the logistics. That is an economic decision on the part of the United States to supply war cheaper than by supplying war with uniform personnel. It is cheaper to contract that out than it is to do the life cycle cost of bringing soldiers to do those logistics functions. Can you explain, sir, what you mean by the logistics functions so people are clear? Logistics functions of providing water, fuel, food, movement of ammunition, uh, setting up bases, forward operating bases, providing all the uh, electrical generation, all the sewage management, all of that is done by contract. Now you can do it with uniform personnel, but it would be far more expensive. So that's a logistics function and it's, it's an economic decision. The intel, the intelligence platform people on contract, and the security people on contract, that's Blackwater, and a lot of others that, uh, that are involved in that. Those are performing functions that should be in the uniformed part of the Defense Department. I believe it wholly inappropriate to contract out men with guns. That is, a, that is a state function. The state should have a monopoly on the use of weapons for coercive power. That is why all policemen, and we've got a lot of security guys in the states who are a contract. I've got a problem with that as well. But the, the idea of men with guns, that needs to be a state sanctioned or owned uh, operation. So I, I am wholly against the, uh, the farming out to contractors of intelligence functions or security functions.